moss. It grows in the cracks and the shadows of your environment. Here in the Pacific Northwest, it grows everywhere. But what very few people know is that some moss species here are extremely rare, so rare that their very locations are clues to colossal events in natural history. They're known as relics, and only a few experts know how to find them. Miles Berkey is one such expert. This thing's called Bartromiopsis lascurii. Here in Washington State, this is a critically imperiled species, and we are at the only known location of where it grows. He's a trained bryologist doing research at Western Washington University. His obsession with moss has him bushwhacking through mountain rainforest by day and analyzing specimens under the microscope by night because he has a hunch that these rare mosses are trying to tell us something. And if he can find enough of them, he might just be able to prove it. Miles and I have just met and he's taking me on a tour of the most important rare mosses that he's found so far. It took him months of trips out here to find these locations. So where are we headed today? That's Big Four behind us, and we are headed up to the base of Big Four. One of the reasons why Miles searches in the Big Four area is that it has a remarkable microclimate. While the nearest town, just a few miles down the road, gets around 50 inches of rain per year, the Big Four area gets around 140 inches of rain per year. That's more than some rainforests, and that north face of Big Four juts 4,000 feet above ground level. It casts such a powerful shadow, for a lot of the year, the areas in front of it never see the sun. And that is part of the reason why there are ice caves at the base, and part of the reason why there are so many species of moss that live there. That constant cooling and shading reduces the amount of evaporation from the area, and so it kind of retains kind of a, a constant moisture regime. Um, it stays wet throughout a lot of the day. Moss need to grow in wet places because they don't have roots to suck up water from the soil. Instead, they have to absorb water from their environment through what's essentially their skin. Our window for finding mosses in this valley is rapidly ending, and we knew it was important to get out here fast. The next big storm will likely close the road and bury everything here in snow until next summer. On our way over, he stopped to show me something called a liverwort. Liverworts are really similar to mosses, but they're not exactly the same. This is a cool one because um, you can actually taste it to determine which species it is. Um, what does it taste like? Perellas generally have kind of a, I don't know, like a bot botanical flavor, but Perella roellii is very spicy, and Perella cordiana is a little less spicy, and Perella navicularis, which is what this is, is not spicy. How would you describe that? <laughs> Mmm, oh, it's like rosemary. Yeah, Perella roellii on my eggs, it's a garnish. The caves are a popular destination for tourists, but just beyond the caves are some of the rarest and most sensitive mosses in the state. Oh, is this the spot? This is Edipodium, Zach. <laughs> it's an exciting little one. Yeah. Careful of that rock, I don't know if that's moving at all. Ooh, yeah. Well, a little slick. I'm glad I found it, and it's... It's it's really hard. It it's right right in here. This moss Edipodium is not just rare here in Washington, but it's rare everywhere that it's found. I'm now on a short list of people who've actually seen this moss growing in the wild. We are at one of the few spots. We're the southernmost spot in North America for where it grows. Up next was a tougher objective. A relic hidden in a waterfall cave. There's a, a creek that's coming down out of the mountains over there. And over there is the species called Sertomnium hymenolophoides. I found it about a year ago um, in a side canyon, actually close to here. And then I, this summer, I wondered if it was behind that waterfall over there. And sure enough, I went over and found it. Yeah, let's, let's go look up here. Nice big Perella liverwort, Perella navicularis. Oh, a little spicy. Maybe it's Cordiana. Yeah. Oh, that's Roellii. Oh, let me um, let me taste. <laughs> that's acrid. You'll you'll you'll. Uh... Oh, yeah. There it is. Yo, <laughs> yeah, that it's that, it's that like is latent. spicy. Dude, that is actually spicy. Mm -hmm. My tongue, like. Mm -hmm. So up there behind that water, that's where the, that's yeah. where the relic yeah. is. As the water
water smacks the ground over centuries, it excavates a cave behind itself with the perfect cool, moist conditions for this relic. Oh my goodness, it's so icy. Water from these falls is condensing on these twigs and grasses and then freezing, creating these almost tentacle-like structures. Totally wild. Immediately, Miles got to work, using a probe to test the water for calcium. Your hair might not like hard water, but this moss species loves it. It's a hard moss to find, but testing the water helps him narrow down his search areas. And we're here uh, up the Perry Creek drainage uh, in a side canyon right behind a waterfall. Now, what's interesting and special about this spot is that it is home to this little tiny moss. So this little tiny moss is called Stratomnium hymenolophoides. And it's the only known location of it within 500 miles of here, and it's new for Washington State. This species is actually common in the Arctic, but Miles was the first person to find it all the way down here in Washington State. When I looked up its range maps, Washington wasn't even included, which means most experts don't even know it's here. So what's this mostly Arctic species doing down here? To answer that question, let's set the scene. It's 20,000 years ago, and where the Space Needle is today is covered in about 3,000 feet of ice. Any living thing that can has migrated south, and any living thing that can't, well, they've either died out or retreated to small ice-free zones, like the wind-blasted tops of mountains that have just barely kept their chin up above the ice, seen here in Antarctica where the ice ages never actually ended. These places where life took refuge are known as refugia, and like oases in the desert, life was able to hang on in these places through some of the harshest conditions imaginable. Miles has been working with leading experts to reconstruct where the ice would have been during this time, and what they've determined is that small sections of mountain valleys, like the place we were just exploring, actually were ice-free. In these places in modern times, we find strange, isolated species that normally grow in much colder, icier climates, like up north in the Arctic or on the tops of mountains. Surrounded by a barren wasteland, these sections of mountain valley could have been the home for a whole community of plants and even animals. So how does Miles use rare mosses to prove that the Big Four area was one of these refugia? The best evidence would be finding organisms from this ancient ecosystem that are still here. But the problem is, most of them would have left after the ice melted, but the moss we were just looking at couldn't have. That's because it doesn't send out spores on the wind to reproduce like other mosses. A spore on the wind can travel an immense distance. Instead, the way it reproduces is little pieces of it, called vegetative propagules, break off and then start growing all on their own, carried by gravity. And as you can imagine, they don't get far. And so as a result, we may be looking at the approximate location that this moss was growing 20,000 years ago. There are no more woolly mammoths no more saber-toothed tigers. It may be that all that remains of this unique Ice Age community is this moss. And this species in particular, Sertomnium, it's a known indicator of Ice Age refugia around North America. So when Miles found this tiny plant growing in this tiny crack behind the waterfall, it was huge for his research. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I didn't recognize it. There's a lot of times where you don't know what it is, but you, when you, you're certain that you don't recognize this at all, that means something. So I got excited about that, went back to the university. Yeah, I, I talked to some other people. They're like, oh, that thing looks, looks like Sertomnium. You should look into that genus. I'm like, oh, that doesn't seem right. And then I looked into it, sure enough, took some photos, got some more confirmation, and it hit me a few days later that, okay, like we, this is something that's likely been in place since the last glaciation. And that's really cool. That's what I'm looking for. To find these mosses, Miles goes out looking in the mountains almost every week during the season. And with that season coming to a close, I asked him, could we go somewhere that he'd never been to before and do one final hunt? I love these uh, cold, clear mornings. Like forest is so inviting. You just want to go in there and check stuff out. That looks nice up there. Oh my goodness. It's yeah. hard to separate yourself from the desire to climb the rocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. I'm looking for a, a big boulder field um, against a cliff. 
I think we could try. Let's just get out of the car and look at this. Okay. Well, ideally, what I would like is just not as much of that small talus. Um, I think we should. I think we should continue going a little bit down. The thirty-two. Oh, coffee. This part of the valley here, it's been heavily logged and burned, I think, and so it's a bit more disturbed of habitat. So I'm, I'm like, I have my doubts. Oh, that is interesting. You're basically, you look at the cliffside. There might be something really great over there. Oh, you're, are you thinking? Yeah, pull up to this, yeah. pull up there. That's what I'm looking at. I'm, I think that, I think we can get over there. Yeah, yeah, let's explore that area. Let's like, look at this for a second here. What I'm interested in is uh, these goalies up kind of these parts of the cliff that protrude from the cliff base. Oh yeah. I'm interested in those kind of wet depressions um, back yeah. in there. Oh, that looks cool. Go, let's enter, watch the splash here. Ooh, could be slick. slick. Yeah, watch yourself. I go low. This looks like another branch, but it's not. It gets really wrapped around you. Yeah, it does. This here is Rachmetrium lanaginosum. Uh, it loves growing on these talus fields on top of these boulders here. You'll notice there's like this kind of hoary or whitish appearance to it. And towards the end of the leaves, they are bleached white. They're called hyaline awns. And hyaline awns basically serve to collect dew. They're dew points for, for the moss. So like arms kind of outstretched to catch the fog. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I've gotten onto some like cliff bases doing these, these surveys from my masters where following a moss or something like that, trying to get up to, it looks like a hot spot of diversity and kind of don't realize the terrain I'm walking through. But I've definitely gotten to spots where I'm on wet rock and down climbing is a little hairy and I didn't realize I I kind of climbed to get up to that spot. It's like you're like focused on something and you're just kind of like, like a dog running up to it and then you realize you're like, oh shit. So that's where we're heading. We're gonna try to go up on the other side of the cliff. You have to be, have a meticulous eye it's kind of hard having a meticulous eye when you're going up through terrain like this. You're kind of walking along a wall of continuous diversity. It's like kind of like you're at the sushi restaurants and you see like good ones come along or you just kind of keep waiting for something to happen. Eat a podium, dude. What? Yeah. This is, uh, yeah, that's crazy. Oh my God. Yeah, so we have it all, this is uh, great. We came to a, holy shit. no, there's, it's all up in here. Oh, dude, this is the spot. This is uh, the third location of Oedipodium for the state. It's really rare. Um, holy It's shit. really rare, again, throughout its global distribution like we talked about earlier. But if we look hard enough, oh God, it's so thick in here. This is amazing. I've never seen it actually this thick. So you can see a gemme all over in here. God, this is cool. Exciting. Yeah, Oedipodium again is like just very rare. It's like not often accounted anywhere really in the world. Oedipodium is that first moss that we found, the really rare one. Unlike some other rare mosses that are hard to distinguish, even a total amateur like me can instantly identify Oedipodium. So if there were a lot of it out there, it would have been found already, making it truly bizarre to Miles and I that we found it. But yeah, this is great. This is it all in here. It's it's like, and it's, it is a kind of interesting. It looks like Oedipodium, for the most part, is restricted to these kind of veins where water, the water courses, probably receives sheet drainage, is my guess. It, drainage like water, water coming. falls there and then just kind of like comes down here and then doesn't evaporate very quickly yeah. because it's shaded by all these yeah. things that don't have leaves anymore. Yep.
I don't see any sporophytes. I'll just collect this little chunk here. I want to be fairly discreet with how I collect because there's not a ton of it here. Don't want to affect the population too much. Yeah, so I'll just fold it up. So we managed to catalog the third location of Oedipodium in the state. Is yeah. That right? Yep. And then we continued up here um, to see if we could find more, and it's just, it's totally too dry here. Mm -hmm. Then, on our way down, Miles saw something strange out of the corner of his eye, and he popped it in his pocket, not thinking much of it. But he'd be in for a big surprise when he got home. We were coming down from this bushwhack, going alongside the cliff band, kind of going through some tricky terrain, sliding rocks, and we were trying to keep a distance from each other. I was kind of doing what I normally do when I'm in kind of hairy, hairy sites where there's kind of a, a risk of you know, injury or slipping. If I do find something that's of interest, I'll just take it, pluck it, put it in my pocket, and remember to key it out later. Came back here, uh, threw it underneath, underneath this scope, and I immediately knew what it was. Miles is now the first person to have ever found this species growing in Washington State. It's a new record for Washington State. It is a species that is mostly boreal to arctic distribution, but anomalously it is growing down around 2,000 feet in uh, the Barlow Pass area. Uh, we found it in close proximity to Oedipodium, which is also a very, very rare bryophyte, also of kind of more northern, um, northern distribution. It was very interesting. Whether it was it a coincidence, I don't know, maybe, or was it in fact that this place where it inhabits is um, a remnant from an ice-free time? How often, how often does that happen for bryologists in general and for you to find a new species for, for your state? It doesn't happen often. So it's a pretty exciting moment when that, when that happens. It's uh, exciting that, you know, I'm the first one to collect it. Uh, it it's exciting that we have a new record of this liverwort um, for Washington State. And um, yeah, it's exciting to be a part of the um, development of biology in Washington state as well. Big shifts in climate like ice ages or global warming cause swaths of species to go extinct. And if Miles is right that this place is an ice age refugium, it may become a place where modern species go to survive climate change. As climate change forces species to move further north, say that are uh, more intolerant of a warming climate, these places that act as cold sinks might serve as a refuge for species today that can no longer deal with the effects of climate change. If they were refuges then, they may well be refuges again. Thank you.